Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. Uh, particularly, I know if there's some people here who traveled quite far to be with us today uh, to remember Frank Boat, and we really appreciate you all coming out uh, to join us today. Um, just to let, let you know a little bit about uh, organization. Though. So we have a few people who contacted me who, who indicated that they'd like to speak today. Uh, but in the middle, uh, we're going to have a, a slideshow presentation. And after that, I'll invite anybody who, who feels like they might want to come up and, and say a few words to come down and do so um, uh, at that time. Um, but I'm going to get us uh, started this afternoon. And what I'd like to do is um, do two things. First of all, I'd like to sort of remind us of Frank Vogt's scientific contributions and accomplishments. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Frank as a person, uh, some of the characteristics I really enjoyed about him in, in my time that I, I, I was able, to, I was fortunate to work with. Uh, so Frank Vogt received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees from the Technical University of Karlsruhe, Germany. Uh, he worked on his doctoral studies with Morris Tocht. Uh, he then went on to a first postdoctoral appointment at Georgia Tech with Boris Vitsaikov, and then an additional postdoctoral appointment at Arizona State University where he worked with Carl Bush. Uh, Frank and I both joined the University of Tennessee as assistant professors in 2005, and he was a, promoted to associate professor with tenure in 2011. Uh, most of us know Frank's research interests. Uh, he developed optical spectroscopy techniques, and particularly Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Uh, but he also developed geometric methods for analyzing data, and he really com combined these for applications such as environmental studies, and, and particularly understanding how microalgae chemical signatures reflect the state of their ecosystems. Um, although, unfortunately, Frank's research career uh, was, was cut quite short, um, he was very productive. He published over 50 papers during his research career, uh, and he has been funded by the National Science Foundation since 2011. In thinking about how to talk about Frank's research accomplishments, I think one of the best ways to understand that is how people are viewed in their field. And so at various points in faculty life, we are reviewed by uh, really prominent people in the field who assess our work. And so I wanted to read just a few uh, short uh, summaries of Frank's work that came from respected people in the field. Uh, so one example, uh, one writer wrote, writing now on the details of his scholarly work, Dr. Vogt is tenaciously addressing and solving important challenges in chemical <laughs> measurement science. He has built solidly upon his areas of expertise and is a recognized national and international leader in the field of analytical chemistry with specialization in chemometrics and spectroscopic measurements for application to aqueous environment studies. Frank has assembled an outstanding research platform to simultaneously make fundamental advances in the chemometrics field, facilitating accurate, non-invasive spectroscopic monitoring of aqueous environments. This research program provides dramatic insight into the ecological implications engendered by chemical changes imposed on an aqueous environment. Another writer writes, I have always admired the rigor of Professor Volk's work. The research is done carefully and results are not published or presented until a high standard is met. In his work, the careful design of the experiments, the mathematical rigor of the modeling, and the great attention to detail in processing the spectra data are impressive. I have also heard Professor Volk give a number of presentations at scientific meetings and the quality and rigor of the work are very apparent in both the results presented and in his response to questions. And so I thought that really tells us a lot about uh, the respect for Frank's work from leaders in his field. Well, I won't go into detail, I'll also mention that Frank was, of course, a very dedicated teacher here at the University of Tennessee in analytical chemistry coursework. I think we have a number of people here who probably took his courses over the year. And, of course, he had a variety of contributions to service, and most notably, he was our associate head from 2011 to 2016. Um, but now I'd like to tell you, you know, sort of characteristics of Frank that I really appreciated. Um, 
And one first thing that comes to mind is Frank was a hard worker. Uh, he was in his office in Bueller Chemistry Hall building uh, quite a lot. Uh, for those of you who worked with him know that. Uh, in fact, I remember after we had both been here about 10 years, uh, he told me one day that he had recently discovered that he, had, he could occasionally escape Bueller on weekends and, and maybe go hiking or do something else that he enjoyed. Um, so he was a very hard worker. I think also uh, Frank's reputation, I, I served on a lot of doctoral committees with him. Uh, he was very tough. Uh, some of you might remember that as well. Uh, on committees that we served on, I can remember him when the student uh, finished their presentation, that deep German voice in the back of the room, uh, probing with, uh, with questions. Uh, but you know, although he was very tough, he, he, was, he was definitely fair. He did it because he wanted to maximize the potential of the student who was defending for their best interests. And then I would say, even though he was tough, Frank was a good guy. He was a good-natured person. Um, he was very honest. You could trust him. Uh, I kind of considered him like a big German teddy bear uh, <laughs> in our department. Um, I think most of us would say that Frank was a very quiet person who kept to himself. Um, and I was thinking about this, and you know, in our profession, uh, it really pays to, to sort of be an extrovert and go out and beat everybody and, and sell your science, which is great. Um, and I think Frank, you know, I, I don't want to uh, get the wrong impression, he certainly went to many conferences and was well known in, in his field. Um, but Frank was an introvert, and I think he really stayed true to himself, and he focused on doing the science and mentoring his students uh, more so than I would say advertising it. And then I wanted to comment on Frank's impact, uh, both at Tennessee and science. Um, we lost Frank far too young. He was a young man. Um, however, I think he, his impact has already been made. And that is through the research that I previously mentioned. But I would say just as much through his training of young scientists. And so I think people decide to go into faculty positions for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I think a really common reason is that many of us, um, our own lives were really greatly enhanced by being scientists, by doing science research, interacting with colleagues. And so that can be for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think we enjoy the intellectual stimulation of research, the challenge. Uh, I think that uh, it brings a lot of meaning to our lives to try and work to solve important societal pro problems for the good of everyday people. Uh, and I think that it provides us community to work with scientists who have similar outlooks and interests as ours. And finally, of course, it provides us a good quality of life, life for our family and for us. And I think that for faculty members like Frank Vogt, and I think this is a key area of impact for the life of Frank Vogt, and we really need only look at the students who learn under his tutelage, Students like Bo Latrell, Chris Gilbert, Rebecca Horton, Morgan McConaughey lewis <coughs> Kendall Wayne Seabright, Eddie Durante, Robert Ked Bird, Zachary Offern, Bahad Hassan, Natalie Dunn, Amber Gray, and Zareen Tathley, as well as the many other students who he taught and supervised over the years who uh, benefited from his clear passion for science. These students will continue to carry on Frank's passion for science and commitment to the students, and in so doing, they will continue to build upon the legacy of Frank Vogt. Thank you. <coughs> so that, I'd like to, with that in mind, I'd like to bring up two of Frank's students, Fahad Hassan and Nelly Dunn, who'd like to say a few words. about the world around him and worrying about everything. And 
he, it led to a very interesting part of his character where um, and I thought that he, whenever you'd have a conversation with him, if you later reflected on that conversation and thought that maybe he might have offended you, even though he never once offended me, he would then come back to me days after I'd forgotten the conversation, and then he would apologize and bring it up, and I'd be like, what? I don't even remember this. Like, um, and he, I admired his ability to, to admit mistakes, because I think that's something that people just, they don't like to, they don't like to admit that they've done something wrong, to the point where it was kind of like, he didn't actually do anything wrong. He was just apologizing for no reason. Um, he, whenever he grew out his mustache, he um, worried <laughs> that it might not look cool or that it might be creepy. And so he asked each member of the group at least eight times uh, whether or not the mustache looked good. Um, at first I wasn't sure, and I was honest with him. So then he, I had to reassure him constantly when the mustache grew in. I thought it looked quite good. Um, and I had to like reassure him that that it was uh, <laughs> that it was okay, um, but his, his constant questioning about that that something as simple as a mustache just cracked us all up. Um, whenever Dr. Brooks seemed to be in a bad mood, uh, there was a really easy cure that we had for that. Um, we could either go into his office and then ask him about hiking or about computer programming, and he would immediately light up, and then he would start telling us about. The time that he almost, like how last week he almost stepped on a rattlesnake, or the time that he saw a bear cub, and then he looked to his other side and he saw the mama bear, and he realized that he should probably get out of that situation. Um, or he will just start telling you about code, and I don't understand what he's actually talking about, but he'd smile and nod and, and watch him cheer up. Um, there was also another trick with him. If you ever wanted him to leave the room for any situation, you just had to mention blood, needles. <laughs> um, one time I told him that I wanted to be at work because I had to go to the dentist and get a crown, and he just threw his hands up in the air and said, that's all I need to know. Um, <laughs> he, uh, the, there was one time where um, I told him I had to get blood, and all of a sudden the chair's just spinning, and he was gone. Uh, no worries. <laughs> I feel like I can speak for all the students in Dr. Brooks' group. Um, that we were fortunate to work with him. He, he trusted our opinions and he believed in us. Uh, even if you weren't quite confident in your own abilities, he, even if he was annoyed with you that you weren't working as hard as he thought you were, he always believed in you and he always let you know that at the end of the day. Okay. So Dr. Rhodes loved helping people. He loved helping his students. Um, and for those of us who knew him well, um, he, was, he was a really great person. I would avoid talking to him in the mornings because I did I don't like mornings and I would look upset every morning until at least 10 a.m. So if he ever saw me before 10 a.m., he would come into my office later on and be like, "Are, are you okay?" Um, and I'd have to reassure him that no, I'm, I'm fine. It's just morning. I don't feel like smiling. Um, uh, it, I know that every now and then he would come into each of our offices while we were alone and just check in on us and like ask us if we were okay. Um, and but when it came to his own health, he, um, he shrugged off our concerns about him and told us that he needed to take care of us and his research. Um, yeah. So I take comfort in knowing that he passed away in his home. He didn't have to deal with blood and needles and doctors and hospitals and things that he was truly petrified of. He passed away knowing that his students cared about him. Fahad drove food to him like that night. So he knew that he was lucky when he passed. Hi, um, I joined Dr. Bob's lab in, uh, in the fall of 2014. Um, I am honored because of getting this opportunity to spend four years, uh, more than four years, uh, to uh, work with him. And um, it, was, it was really special for me because um, we maintained a very close relationship. Um, his passing is a, like Dr. Best said, uh, it's a great loss for the scientific community uh, in the world of chemometrics. Uh, he was one of the best chemometricians in the southeast region of the country. So, uh, but for me, on my personal level, it's, a, it's, a, it's really uh, frustrating for me because um, he was, uh, I treated him like my family member in this country, the only family member. Um, and it's a great loss, and I do not know how to express. Um, I recently graduated, and I really wish he was at my wedding ceremony with me. Um, but 
this is life, this is reality. Uh, he is not here with us, that's the reality. But this also tells me one more thing. Um, I mean, I only spent four years with him, but um, his parents are probably the one that were going through uh, immense pain at this moment. Um, I hope they can recover from this, uh, from this deep uh, pain. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to communicate with him um, thanks to Dr. Burns and Katharina Holland, uh, who helped me to translate uh, their letters in, from German to English. But um, I wish they can recover from this great loss. Um, their pain will not go away, but I hope they, they can heal themselves. Um, so today I want to talk mainly about, the, um, about his interaction with the students, um, with us. Um, he was a great character, I mean, he had many good characteristics, and uh, I only want to talk about uh, our interactions uh, in the lab um, and outside the lab. Um, so, um, he was always supportive of us. He wanted to make sure we have all the resources. Um, we pretty much stocked up all the consumables for six months um, from now. So, even after he was gone, we had chemicals and we could sustain life for six or seven months. Uh, because he had this vision to uh, make sure that everything is running smoothly, everything is German in his way. Um, so um, that that's 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 kind of a thing that grew into me, um, and uh, eventually this was his goal uh, to grow us so that we can uh, we can be a better person, better researcher, um, better people in 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 our life, and. Um, we are also following this thing. We are uh, trying to make sure that we plan ahead of time for five or four months later from now what will happen. We keep this, that always in our head. Um, plus, whenever we have to go to a conference, um, we always have to pay from our pocket. And then uh, when, um, probably after the conference, we get reimbursed. But he, all, he knew about our uh, Paycheck and everything, so yeah, he gave us his credit card, uh, and we usually used that to pay all the money, uh, to all the cost, um, our flight, our hotel, and everything. Um, in response, at the end of the conference, three or four months later, when we get reimbursed, um, instead of him, we get the money in our bank account. Um, so we had to write a check to him, and um, we were always joking about him uh, about this thing. Um, he also made sure that we had uh, all the resources for us to shine, uh, to thrive in our lab. Um, for example, uh, there was this one day uh, in the December, I think it's December of uh, 2017, when the semester was over, all of a sudden he came with a printer and he was like, uh, it's a Christmas gift for you. I was like, wow, we already have a printer. Um, <laughs> like, okay. Um, now, um, Back in, I think, uh, last year, sometime around March 2018, he took us uh, for a trip at the Office Max or the Staples, uh, one of these places, to get, yeah, to get us uh, a chair uh, uh, monitor, even though we did not ask for it. And um, at the end of the day, he never really uh, reimbursed, get reimbursed for this, and he spent uh, out of his own pocket so that we can have access to the best resources available. And. Uh, this was about the physical resources, but uh, for me the best part was the mental support that I received from him. Um, and all I can speak for all my group members when I say uh, we were not, I mean, whenever we needed some uh, aid from someone uh, around us, he somehow sensed it that I, am, uh, I need some kind of assistance. I do not know how he did it, uh, but um, he had this idea that, uh, that this person needs some kind of assistance or something um, and he really supported all of us uh, on and off um, there was a time uh, in your graduate study when you hit the rock bottom and you were not happy with your performance I when I hit that point I was like straight up to him and I was talking to him uh, like I do not know I mean if I'm good enough for PhD and things like that he was he just told me father look at it in my eyes and do this thing. <laughs> it's like, okay, um, I know you can do it. And um, he really motivated me. He told me um, that I have all the qualities that is needed to finish, finish the program. And here I stand today, um, just finishing the program uh, earlier this month. 
Um, plus, other than that, um, whenever we needed any type of uh, support, or like um, we're not doing well, or maybe we needed some motivation, um, there are uh, stories about uh, his parent, his parents, his families. Um, I also shared my experiences with uh, with him and um, politics, religion, certain president of a certain country. I'm not going to name them. <laughs> um, so there are so many different topics. Um, but um, he did that intentionally to make sure that we can get a diversion from our lab um, and um, can come back and restart this whole brain uh, process so that we can start focusing again on our research. And he had this um, quality that I do not know how he, how he possessed it, but um, he also uh, sent Natalie and Amber to China so that all, the only reason for that, even though he initially said uh, the science was the main reason, but later he confessed to me uh, when they were at China, uh, he told me that um, he wanted them to grow up so that uh, they can adapt to a new environment, life at a new place. And he spent a significant amount of money out of his own pocket to do that. And these are the things that uh, he kind of uh, figured out that the student will be need, and uh, he came up with a solution. Uh, five days uh, before he passed away from us, uh, we did kind of an intervention, like, Dr. Um, Bob, you were being ridiculous, you need to go to the doctor right now. Um, and he thought we were disappointed at him because of his uh, efficiency uh, in, in the lab. So he told me, he told us one thing that uh, that was that pretty much sums up uh, the um, the whole idea that he had about his students. He said, uh, "I will take a bullet before it hits you." Thank you all.
met him in 2001. I was an assistant professor at Georgia Tech, and he worked with Boris Mosaiko. And Boris' group and my group had lots of interactions. And we had many social activities together. He was my climbing partner for indoor climbing. We did this twice a week for nearly his entire time at Georgia Tech. On the weekends, at least twice a month, we went mountain biking. So I think I met him in a different way. You all met him here at uh, the University of Tennessee. My feeling was at the time when he came to the US, he really appreciated the freedom of the academic system. And it was already then clear to me that he doesn't want to go back to Europe or Germany. He enjoyed the academic enterprise in this country more than he did what we have in Germany. I think he also discovered a level of freedom for himself that he had not had a chance to discover back home. He was a very social person when his environment offered opportunities to become social. He was not a good instigator of social events. So I met him in a very different place and my memories are very different. I came, I had contact with him when he was in Arizona. We talked a little bit about mountain biking and climbing, but then he also asked me some professional questions. And he also asked me a few professional questions after he came to the University of Tennessee. And then I joined the University of Tennessee in Oak Ridge in 2010, and I saw him repeatedly, and I said, hey, let's do something. I invited him to parties that I had that I organized, it never worked out, not once, in eight years. And that was a little disappointing, but I also am disappointed in myself that I was not more pushy to really take him out. But it seemed to me that something has changed in him. The way I knew him in 2001, 2002, 2003, he was outgoing when I told him, hey, let's have a beer, he was there. And it didn't happen anymore when I met him again in Tennessee. And maybe that's a message that I'm wondering about. Maybe what, what is different? He was a very social person caring about his students. Does the system care about people like him? What can the system do to make, to get make sure that he, he should have gotten something that he couldn't get. So he gave all of his energy to his students. And I think there's a break, and I recognize that, and I try to help, but he didn't take my help. And now I blame myself for not being pushy enough to give him this help that he may have needed to, things may have looked out a little differently. That's my feeling, my personal feeling. So I missed the guy. He was good in many aspects. He was also a very social guy. He had social qualities that the students experienced, but other people may not have had a chance. And I'm wondering what, this, what is the barrier? Can we do something to break down these barriers? Student in first one out. 
Um, everything that's been said today by students, colleagues, are all characteristics that I've experienced as well. And you know, I was listening to what Fahad and Natalie were saying, which were all qualities and characteristics that I was aware of when I was with Frank. But uh, so we, we do have a lot of overlap with our experience with them. Um, unfortunately, they were around during his final days here at Tennessee. Um, and I know that must be really tough. Uh, one difference that I had is that I was here during his first days in Tennessee. Um, so that's probably one little, one little thing I can share with you that's probably a little different in some ways than some of these other stories that you've heard. So I started here at Tennessee uh, January of 2004. And uh, I was in another group for about a year and a half, and I decided to, to switch groups. And uh, I went to the associate chair at the time, it was Fred Shell. And I was like, hey, Fred, you know, through the whole spiel. And uh, he, was, he was very empathetic, very nice, gave me lots of uh, information. I said, we need to talk to some other folks in the department, to join another group. I said, okay. Uh, he said, we have this new guy down on the third floor, who's Frank Boat. I was like, Frank, but okay. He goes, you should go talk to him. I think uh, what he does may be interesting to you. Frank knew me. I was a newer grad student, and we had interacted several times. Kind of knew where my interests were. So he said, uh, go down and talk to him. I was like, well, should I set up an appointment with him or something? He's like, nah, just go down there. He's down there. His door will be shut. Just knock on it. If he doesn't answer the first time, knock again. He goes, but let me warn you, he's German. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, all right. He was like, no, like, oh, he's, he's German. I just, I warned you. I'm like, okay, all right. It's going to be a new experience, I guess. Um, anyway, so I went down there, went to the end of the third floor. He was down there in that final wing. I knocked on the door. I hear a chair move. Unhappy. So I knocked again, and I hear, I hear somebody get up and they come to the door. And the door opens just enough for this head to pop out. And all I remember was, wow, well, there's red hair and a red face looking at me with an anti-smile. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe this is what Fred was, was indicating. Fred was German. So there was an anti-smile, I didn't know they existed, but he put me wrong and just looked at me. Yes. I said, are you Frank Boat? Yes. <laughs> I said, I'm Bo Luttrell. Okay. <laughs> I was like, uh, I, I was nervous. I, I was nervous now. Now I, now I knew what Fred was. Uh, warning me about. It's like, oh, okay, uh, here I am, this grad student, he doesn't know, I'm switching groups, what is he going to think, I'm interrupting him, I know he's an assistant faculty member, just starting, he's probably got a million things on his desk, and here I am, just showing up. And uh, so I, I gave him my little spiel, I said, hey, I'm switching groups, I want to talk to you, uh, is now a good time? And he just kind of looked at me. Yes. <laughs> We just kind of stood there awkwardly for about 40 seconds, but it felt like 40 minutes. And then he was just like, uh, come in. <laughs> so I was just like, okay, and then the door opens, you know. He sits down. His desk is very German. There's nothing on it except for like a little laptop and a pencil, you know, and that was that. Because everything was up here. And uh, so anyway, long story short. We started talking. I asked him about what he what he does, what's his expertise, and uh, and it only took about ten minutes. And that very uh, German stiff sight melted away, and that big German teddy bear sight just came roaring out. I mean, it it was 
it was like night and day from the time he opened the door and about 10 minutes later it was late. And for those of you that have met Frank, you probably understand what I'm saying. You get that very stiff, anti-smile <laughs> face and then the underneath, and he was a teddy bear. I mean, and that's not anything to discredit him. He was very vigilant as a scientist professionally, but and he was a caring guy. He really was. Um, we talked for three hours that day. Because once you get him going on his scientific interests and his plans and all of that, it's like a kid. It's like a little kid with, with whoa. With, with just a big red German face. And it's just in a smile, you know? Uh, it was great. And those three hours flew by and ended up leaving. And I think it was two days later, I went to Fred Shell's Fred office and I told him, I said, Look, I you know, thank you for all your advice and recommendations if you want to join Frank's group. And, and I did. And, you know, long story short, three years went by. And I was already a year and a half in grad school. I was with Frank for three years. Did my PhD work. Um, overall, it was a wonderful experience. I would not be where I'm at professionally if it wasn't for him. So when it came time for me to wrap up, do my dissertation, uh, apply for jobs, all that kind of stuff, I informed Frank that I wanted to be a professor at a PUI. That's what I want to do. I love research, but I discovered an unknown passion of mine during grad school, and that was teaching and teaching chemistry to undergraduates. I, 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 that's what I want to do. And Frank, postdoc at two elite labs in America, looks at me and he's like, PUI, huh? R1. R1. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Frank, Frank, I, I get it, man. I get it. I get it. You're, you're all into I get it, but I was like, this isn't like, this. I'm not like disrespecting you or anything. I just, this, that's what I want to do. And I thought, I didn't know how it was going to go. I thought he would push back and I don't know. You just, sometimes you can't tell. But once he saw the passion in me, what I wanted to do, he was so accepting and supportive of it. He wrote me a wonderful letter. And checked on me like every week while I was doing the application process, going on the interviews, and all that kind of stuff. Articulate your side of the story, just validate it. He does it in years, 11 years have gone, but I can't believe it. And I think one thing that Frank would have been really proud of is knowing that one of my former research students at Salisbury University, where I've been, did research with me for three semesters just defended her PhD in Tennessee last March, Andrea Becker. Hey, that kind of stuff would make Frank giddy. And I wish he would have seen that. Because he knows how proud I am of her. That's the kind of pride he felt toward me. I know it. He was a good dude. Really good dude. A couple of things that Frank did, I mean, I could go on and on about funny things. But when Frank first got here, and now I know these two guys right here, John Francois and Nick, we can talk more about Frank. Um, Frank came into the States, straight from Germany. A lot of things would get lost in translation when he would try to say something. It would come out quite right. Uh, me and Frank's second graduate student, Chris Gilbert, we would call him Frankisms. And there were just wonderful statements that didn't make a whole lot of sense, but we knew what he meant. But it just always provided some comic relief in the lab, especially during those months when projects weren't working. Um, but one thing Frank would always say to me and to the other students in the lab at the time, he would suggest something, write a standstill on a project, he would give us a recommendation. And I'd be like, Frank, I don't know if that's going to work, man. You know, this and that, you go, Bo, you don't know until you do. <laughs> so if you do know something, then that means you no longer don't know it? Or does that mean you don't know the outcome until you do the experiment? I think it was the latter. 
But it was still funny because it was perplexing. You won't know until you do. Well, I guess if you do know something, you no longer don't know it, right? Is that what you're saying? Just, you better do. And then he'd leave. <laughs> that you better do. But, okay. I think Nike needs to change their slogan to that. <laughs> Instead of just do it, you better do. Frank. <laughs> anyway, so I'll leave with that. Um, but one thing I want to ask about the slideshow, the slideshow was great. You probably didn't recognize me in most of the pictures. I had more hair up here and less here. But anyway, um, where were the mustache pics? <laughs> I've worked with the guy for three years. I never saw a mustache. I would have loved to if you have one, email it to me. I'm at Salisbury University. Just email it to that. Let's see. All right. Now, um, I do have a, a brief statement to read from Frank's second graduate student, Chris Gilbert. He can't be with us today. Um, he was also Frank's second PhD student, so second and second. Um, so I'm going to read this verbatim. So these are Chris's words. And you'll see how there's overlap between all the other things you've heard today from other people. It's, it's just funny. It's just, it's just wonderful. Anyway, here we go. It's from Crystal. Frank and I were not friends. <laughs> he was my PhD advisor, so I guess that makes us more like family than anything else. Those of you in this room understand what I mean. Like any family, there were some ups and downs, projects that didn't work out, projects that did, clashes over source code and manuscript writing. Manuscript writing. The man totally hated the way I wrote. Dinner and drinks at restaurant Linderhof. Mike used to love to drink beer. He used to love going to Linderhof for dinner. It was awesome. And then finally shaking his hand after a successful defense. Through it all, the thing that sticks out the most was Frank's curiosity, rarely completely satisfied, that drove him to constantly ask why and what if. His joy when things were working and working well was very contagious prompting brainstorming sessions in his office well after most normal people were asleep, him chugging grapefruit juice, but he knows while everyone else <laughs> well, everyone else is chugging caffeine. The man loved grapefruit juice. It's crazy. God, the amount of grapefruit juice that people consume. It's unreal. It's like the laws of physics don't allow it. It's like that volume of grapefruit juice in that volume of body Anyway, it kept him going. Frank helped teach me to question, to wonder, to think, and examine from different directions. He left me with an, <laughs> and, and the, uh, he left me with wonderful Frankisms like "you better do" and something about catching two birds with one stone. <laughs> something, something like that. Often the source of many fond memories and a smile. Frank and I fell out of contact after I graduated, and I regret that. I would give a lot to have another chance to talk with him again, maybe collaborate on some science, to just say goodbye. So goodbye, Frank. Man, you're missed. I also wanted to read, uh, so Kelsey Cook, uh, faculty member here at Tennessee, I think many of us know he was, he was close to Frank and uh, he went off to serve as an NSF program officer. He sent me a few words he'd like and I'm going to read those as well here. Kelsey says, first, I extend to Frank's group my deepest condolences on a very significant loss. I have lost a good friend and the department has lost a great colleague, but the students have lost a dedicated and inspiring mentor. Based on my assessment of Frank's commitment and sincerity, I'm convinced that, like my own mentor, Frank would have retained that role effectively throughout his student's career. <coughs> his students and colleagues lost far exceeds mine. The second point I wanted to convey to Frank's students was my admiration, not just for their insight in selecting the challenging and important research area in which Frank was a leader, but also for their determination, courage, and wisdom in continuing to chase their dreams. Although Frank won't be there to help them directly, I expect that the boldness and excellence of his research continue to inspire them as their own determination and intellect carry them to promising careers. Immediately after I recently met with Frank's students, I gave a departmental seminar entitled Think Big, NSF's 10 Big Ideas. To illustrate a key point, I noted that every new dollar apportioned by Cong Congress to the National Science Foundation in the past two years has been allocated to what our director has called the 10 Big Ideas. 
One of the big ideas is called NSF 2026, a title meant to imply that the initiative is likely to remain important for some time to come. Frank's forefront NSF-funded research directly targeted two of the big ideas, harnessing the data revolution and understanding the rules of life. Frank and his students were and are pioneers in this, these important interdisciplinary ideas. Frank was something of a gadfly in his efforts to urge the traditional and self-critical chemometrics community to embrace these opportunities and the new ideas and challenges that go with them. These are Kelsey words, not mine. Don't criticize chemometrics. Frank knew that just as biochemistry and, by extension, biomedicine are reliant on chemistry, so too are the burgeoning fields of bioinformatics and even biostatistics inextricably intertwined with chemoinformatics. If we embrace that tangle as Frank did, we can participate in and help guide the data revolution. We ignore it at our own peril. So in conclusion, I want to send not only my condolences and my admiration to Frank's group and department, but also my encouragement. Frank saw and pursued important parts of the scientific future. Insofar as he imbued his students and colleagues with his vision and drive, I expect he will continue to guide them to important and meaningful contributions as part of his own legacy. Carry on in his memory and for his sake, as well as your own. Thanks to Kelsey for sending those comments. So I'd like to bring up uh, Jean-François Masson. Uh, Jean-François uh, has come from the University of Montreal to join us. He overlapped with Frank when he was a graduate student at Arizona State, and Frank was a postdoc there. And I want to thank him also for giving a really fantastic memorial research lecture this morning. So actually, I think my assessment of who was Frank Holt was pretty dead on. So this is the Frank you know. So this, it was mentioned earlier on. Actually, Frank had more hair, <laughs> red face, red hair. Yeah. I actually got this from one of your flyers uh, on, uh, that was available on the web from, uh, I think, a newsletter that was published right after Frank was uh, at Tony Depart. So, uh, so Frank and I, we go for that at Arizona State. If one thing is that we're actually roommates for two different periods of times. So we, uh, we shared apartments. When he came to, um, to Phoenix, he, uh, he crashed at my place for a couple of months, and for the time he had to find a place. And when I actually was about to leave, and he was about to leave, I stayed at his place for a little while as well. Uh, so, uh, but we mostly shared an office for two years. And so it was mentioned that Frank had a fear of blood. I was working on blood tests. Could you imagine a conversation in the office would go awkward very fast? <laughs> so and we would actually tease him all the time with that. Uh, actually, I, I did, I did uh, a couple of pranks to Frank. <coughs> One of them, he actually uh, swore to actually catch me once again because I was, it was a bad one. And actually, unfortunately, what I'm sad about is that he will never get the chance to actually catch me. But although after 15 years, he had plenty of chances to. So um, essentially, the prank went there. So he was looking for a job. So I think he had, he had his interview at Tennessee here. And then he had one last interview on the, uh, he had to fly out on a Wednesday. So Frank turns a bit in the panic because it was his last interview. He really, really wanted to stay in the US because of all this that uh, Frank Lefler said that before the enjoyed freedom. So he was pretty nervous. He, he turns around and said, we're Tuesday. He said, no, Frank, we're Wednesday, knowing that he was flying on the Wednesday. And he just turned white. He almost passed out right there. And as I was saying that, I said, okay, that, that was bad. So Frank, I'm sorry. It was bad. And he said, I'm going to get you back. And actually, he was never able to catch me. So um, I guess we, um, that, that was good for 15 years. But I wish he would, would have caught me with something. So I was just waiting for that day where he would get me back. Uh, because it was a bad one. And I felt really bad because it was the last opportunity to get an interview. And um, actually, I got a lot of grief from my lab mates at all. Um, 
We also started about at the same time. So one thing, uh, so once Frank uh, moved to Tennessee, about a couple weeks later, I moved to Georgia Tech. So a short drive from here. And uh, so we, uh, we would hit the Smokies uh, together once in a while. Uh, so I did. I'm also enjoying hiking very much. And um, actually, I was able to pull him off the labs for a full weekend to go to Smokies a couple of times uh, when I came here to, uh, to Tennessee. So I came here at least five to ten times over that period of time. And I came back actually even after that. Um, but I think what, it, what was the best is that for and I, since we started at the same time, we actually acted as, as confidence. So we, we talk about the career uh, fairly often, um, either by calls, by emails, by conferences. So we were able to, uh, uh, to actually navigate through the reality of professorship together. This is something that, uh, that was actually very, very useful for I think, all of us. So this is Frank from the Arizona State Days. You saw the first picture. I did. And then there's uh, Tammy, is Carl Bush's wife, so Frank. Uh, you get both sides of Frank on that slide. The, the joyful Frank on the top right, and the anti-smile that was described. <laughs> I love the description of, of Frank. So actually, I don't know why Frank had the anti-smile in the group picture, but I, I, think, I think it was, it was probably, probably programming something. It was thinking about what line you had to solve at that time. But Frank, who was Frank? So what, I wanted to get more pictures of Frank. So I said, OK, if you want to know something about someone, you just Google. And then what happened is that I don't know if there's an ominous in, in Germany that Frank Vogt, but only two of the pictures were Frank. And they're essentially the same picture. One is smiling a little bit more than the other. So I said, oh, yeah, OK, I, I didn't type in University of Tennessee. So I typed UTK. And then I get two pictures. One is Frank Memorial picture, and the other one is me. OK. Uh, so, so I had to think a little bit deeper. So I had to, to find a little bit more. And I, one thing that actually I, I could always relate to when talking you know, about Frank was Frank's passions. So Frank had, I think, three passions. And the first one was reading. He, he read a ton of books. Uh, he was very literate. He, wanted to, uh, he would read books uh, day in and day out. And so he, he actually uh, enjoyed that very, very much. The second one was science and computing. Uh, and he merged those two in his research program. And the, the third one, I'll just say it was nature. So Frank um, loved to go outdoors and, and do different things. Uh, actually, was an avid mountain biker, as it was mentioned. He was an avid trek uh, trekker as well. Um, he did recommend me so many treks that I've tried over the years, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. He actually was not the safest trekker, actually, ever. Um, so the <laughs> rattlesnakes encounters were fairly common. The bears encounter were fairly common. Uh, I recall seeing a picture, which unfortunately I don't have, but he was mountain biking, and within about six inches of his front wheel was a rattlesnake. So he had time to take his camera out, take the picture with the rattlesnakes within six inches of his front wheel. So uh, yeah, he liked to take some risk, uh, which he did not take otherwise in life. But, um, and I recall, well, I'm not going to tell the Panthers story of hiking trip because I promised him I would never say that story in public. But uh, maybe if you come see me later on, I might be actually um, uh, gives a little bit of an insight of that story. But I'm going to tell you the time where he actually lost a car in a river in Arizona. So he drove to one of, the, one of his treks. And uh, well, what happens is that a flash flood came in and uh, he tried to go across. Well, I see there's no bridges most of these roads, so he tried to go across the river. And actually, uh, the car just sank into the river, and he just left it there and called the, the car company and said, look, your car is stuck in this ditch, can you bring me a new car? <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't take risk, and so he had, took, he had taken the full insurance on the car, so they actually brought him a new car to be able to ride back home. So uh, there are many stories like that for a bit. Uh, Frank's tricks, but uh, I'm going to stop there for the tricks. Uh, just a little word on research. So Frank uh, was a bit of an entire, uh, well, he liked to stir the pot sometimes. So I think his, his greatest accomplishment was this paper. And right before he sent it for, um, for review, he actually had it, let me read the um, abstract. He said, should I do it? He said, Frank, you know best. Essentially, he was questioning his own field. So in this paper, he was reflecting on his own field. And his, his bottom message was, if we're doing the same thing, we're going to disappear. We have to, we have to change something. 
And he was met with a lot of skepticism in this, in this field. But he actually was right, uh, because uh, there is a couple things that he foresaw. And that paper is actually five years old already. Uh, so he saw the big data revolution coming in. Uh, so Frank and I uh, collaborated on a few different projects. And one of them that we were supposed to start uh, was the machine learning project I presented this morning. So we, uh, we had plans to, to work on this uh, together. But he, he foresaw this way before a lot of people did. So uh, th this was actually quite visionary. Uh, but other people will be able to talk about his research uh, in, in better, uh, in more depth than I would. And what we want to take a couple of minutes to read, uh, to show what Frank loved. So, well, so Frank hails from the Black Forest in Germany, uh, where he probably got this, this joy of, of nature and, and uh, trekking. This is one of the most beautiful areas of Germany. And uh, he, he brought his love to, to, to America. So, uh, so one of his favorite places was Southern Utah. So Frank always told me that when he retires, he will buy a lot of land, put a cabin in Southern Utah, and go to school there and trek for the rest of his life. So, um, so these are a couple of pictures of, of treks that I did after Frank recommended to me, which were absolutely amazing. But the only thing is that <coughs> to tell me to, to reach the site, we had, I had to ride, actually probably drive about 60 miles on a dirt road, <coughs> which had no services, nothing, no one else. And the only car I actually saw was broke down. So, um, well, it was a nice trek. So this is the kind of, of, of trek that Frank liked. Well, he wanted to be off the beaten path. So when he went to trek and when he went, he went to, to nature, he wanted to be by himself to, to reflect and, to, and think and, and just resource himself. You saw those pictures, but outdooring, well, golf, Frank, yeah. <clears throat> actually, this is the only time Frank ever played golf. <laughs> uh, I, I wish to tell you that he was good now, uh, but you can see from the smile that he had a good time. Frank had a beer in his hand. I don't. I don't want. Why did I don't have a beer? Actually, I should have had a beer with him at that time. But, um, but Frank just liked to, to, to hang out with people, and uh, so uh, I want to show you the, the, the side of Frank, which you may not have seen the whole lot. But Frank at conferences. So when I was starting to look at for pictures, I think the picture on the left, I thought well, that was the best picture I had of Frank, which means standing behind someone, <laughs> and you can almost tell it's Frank. And then I started to look a little bit deeper, and I got a couple more pictures of, of Frank uh, throughout, uh, throughout the, uh, the past couple of months. So uh, Frank, Frank at conferences was, was always very serious, always very uh, uh, professional, and he was even later at night. But you can see that Frank, <laughs> Actually, uh, well, like beers, uh, so he, uh, he would come up for, with us to have a beer, but uh, always very lively. Um, this is censored for one reason. Okay, I'm not going to go into what's behind that censor. <laughs> but uh, it was very joyful. Uh, so Frank uh, had always been very joyful, but uh, he was always upbeat. So, uh, so I had uh, young kids uh, at home, and he always asked uh, for, for news from, from the kids. Aldo actually never saw them, but he was always caring about the, the family, uh, caring about the, my relatives. Uh, so he knew my brother pretty well. He knew my he came to Montreal a few times, met my family, met the, uh, my family when he came to Arizona as well. I always asked for news from, from my brother. And actually, it was very sudden when my brother actually um, was diagnosed with leukemia a few years ago. And um, so he, he, um, he always asked about him, about his health and everything. So I wish he would have probably cared more about his own health. And get about my family scouts, but uh, well, th this was Frank. But the bottom line, th the only thing that I want to just say uh, to conclude is, it's all about connecting with people. So, so Frank and I had a, an awesome connection, which we, we we shared until the very last days. So I had an email conversation with Frank about 36 hours before. He... But the bottom message is just, it's all about connecting with people and. and and remembering the people we, we care about and, and trying to, to make the most of the time we have together because uh, sometimes, not very often, but people tend to leave it early and, and Frank was one of them. And um, actually my, my last word would just be, um, I'll just be there a second. Goodbye.
this afternoon. I really appreciate everybody, uh, particularly our speakers, for coming and telling us about their experiences with Frank, uh, and for, for all of you for, for coming out. Um, and uh, I would just say, you know, let's learn from Frank, and let's remember Frank. Thank you, everybody. It's welcome to stay and, and to chat. There are probably people who haven't seen some of their colleagues in a while. Um, but again, I appreciate everybody coming out and joining us this afternoon. Thank you.